All right, thank you so much. So, um, yeah, as, uh, um, as you just heard, uh, heard uh, my name is Wojciech Havlicek. I'm, I'm going to be talking about quantum complexity of co the current coefficients. This is a joint work with Sergey Bravi, Anir Banchoudry, David Gosset, and Guan Yuzu, but also with Christian Enkenmeyer and uh, Satya Subramanian. So, Sergey, David, and uh, Guan Yu are type in quantum. Anir Ban, David are uh, parameter and the uh, University of Waterloo. And Christian Enkenmeyer with Satya are at Boric. So let me give you a brief outline of uh, what I'll be talking about. I'll talk about current coefficients. Uh, they are an important quantity in the representation theory of the symmetric group. And uh, the central theme of this talk is going to be uh, revolving around an observation that we can construct quantum, uh, quantum circuits that allow us to efficiently project on the subspaces of the Hilbert space uh, that have dimension that, that is equal to the current coefficients. And this is very interesting complexity theoretic uh, consequences. It also supports a definition of, a, of an interesting approximate counting uh, complexity class, QXC. And uh, it may also suggest uh, some new template for design of quantum algorithms. I would also say that another motivation for us was pretty much the fact that uh, this work uses um, Fourier transforms over the symmetric group, uh, which uh, haven't been, you know, like used, uh, uh, you know, like too successfully in the quantum algorithms, and we wanted to explore, you know, like where uh, else we can apply them. So let me tell you about Kronecker coefficients. So in order to be able to do that, I have to uh, give you a bit of a rundown of a basic representation theory. So. Um, I guess as some of you may know, you know, like a representation of a finite group is a homomorphism from your group to a set of invertible matrices. You're assigning basically to every element of your group, you're given a matrix, you can invert. And, um, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a homomorphism, so it means that like, you know, like if you, if you map your two group elements to matrices and then multiply the matrices out, or if you first multiply your group elements and then you map it to matrix, you know, like you're going to get the same result. So as an example, you know, like you can consider the uh, symmetry group over three objects. You know, this is permutation over three things. And one specific way of representing its action uh, with matrices is, is the left regular representation that you can see down there. So that representation is nicely described by its action on the uh, basis elements, you know, like in a vector space, it has dimension of the order of a group. So in this case, it'd be a six-dimensional vector space and, and it, it comes with a natural basis where the basis are the group elements themselves. And you act on the group elements by the group multiplication rule, right? So whenever you apply your matrix, that represents a permutation uh, sigma onto a basis state that uh, corresponds to permutation pi, uh, you end up with a, with a basis state psi and uh, pi. And you can write it down as matrices and they look like this. Well, I guess all, you, you may also know that it is a basic fact of representation theory of uh, finite groups that uh, these groups nicely decompose. And uh, they decompose into irreducible representations. What this means is that you can take your representation matrices and you know, find a similarity transform that at the same time block, block diagonalizes all of them. Right? And it block diagonalizes them in a very specific way. It decomposes them into something that is called an isotopic subspace and then irreducible representations. So the irreducible representations are the red boxes here, and the isotopic subspace are the white ones uh, around it. Now, you can see that, you know, like there, there can be multiple irreps in each isotopic subspace. So basically every isotopic subspace corresponds to like a different kind of um, ways, the way your representation acts on the part of your Hilbert space. And uh, you can have multiple copies of, of, of the same, you know, like, like a reducible representation in each one of these uh, subspaces. Right. Um, I've also mentioned that, you know, the, uh, for the symmetry group, the irreducible representations are labeled by partitions or the Young diagrams. You know, that's a nice way of labeling them. So with that, you know, I can tell you what the current coefficient is. You take these two red boxes for two distinct Young uh, diagrams, right? So the Young diagrams here are going to be called mu and nu, and those rows are um, correspond to the red boxes. 
you take their tensor product and you know when you take a tensor product of two irreducible representations it is no longer irreducible in general it decomposes further and when you break it down it 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 it, it breaks down with certain multiplicity you know like like uh, like every irre appears so and so many times and the number of times it appears in this decomposition is exactly the chronicle coefficient it is the red red thing you know like over there the g mu nu alpha right and this is the quantity that we are interested in here you can also use a bit of character theory to find a combinatorial, um, well, more combinatorial formula for this, or, or sort of like an algebraic formula for this. Um, you can express it as a sum over characters of your irreducible representations, and you're basically summing over the entire group, and you get you know uh, some factor times your current coefficient. Right. So let me now tell you how do you actually project onto a subspace uh, that has the dimension of the Corona Kruger coefficient, you know, that corresponds to this quantity. And in order to be able to do that, I have to, to say at least a little bit about the uh, Fourier transform over the symmetry group. So in general, you know, like when you want to define a SM Fourier transform, you take a function over the symmetry group. And, uh, you know, the uh, Fourier transform over the symmetry group then tells you that you can uh, store the same, same information about a function in a set of matrices. And those matrices are you know, like described by the f, f hat of lambda. It's literally just like averaging over your function um, over a specific irrep. Now, you may wonder, okay, well, you know, like like I, on the left-hand side, I have a function. On the right-hand side, I have a set of matrices. Like, how do I uh, turn this into a unitary transformation? Well, you explore the fact that, you know, uh, at least up to normalization, uh, the functions over the symmetry group the map to complex numbers are going to be bijective to vectors in a vector space, uh, sorry, uh, that has a dimension of the of the group order. So you can write down your function as a quantum state that looks like that over there. And in this picture, you can define the SM Fourier transform as a unitary, uh, as a unitary operator that looks like this. And um, there is an efficient quantum algorithm for this. Uh, it was derived by Beals already in 1986. Right. Another known tool uh, that uh, we'll exploit here is the generalized phase estimation. So as far as I know, you know, like this has been uh, uh, derived by RM Harrow in his thesis, and it is, a, it is an algorithm that allows you to project onto isotypical uh, components of, uh, quantum, of, of, of quantum states. So what this means is that if you, if you take a quantum state psi that lives in a uh, you know, representation space, of representation R, so this is the space that you're acting on by representation R, um, and you apply the circuit, you can you can basically use it to implement the projection of your psi onto uh, the isotypical, you know, like uh, subspace of the of the of the of, of the of your of your Hilbert space. So you can visualize the action of the uh, of this of this projector, you know, like um, as um, on the on the bottom left. You pretty much like start with the, uh, you know, like let's say the regular representation, then you block diagonalize it, and when you apply this projector, like it selects only one of the uh, isotypical blocks, so it only chooses like one of the subspaces with, you know, like like the same type of an irreducible representation. And uh, there's also a formula for that, you know, like like um, you know uh, that um, uh, relates to characters, and uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, at the bottom right. So this is the projection that you can implement with a quantum circuit. And note, you know, like that quantum circuit uses a, um, the, the SN uh, for the transform, you know, and the controlled application of the representation. So if you can apply the controlled, uh, if you can apply representation in a controlled way efficiently, then, then the circuit is, uh, you know, uh, also efficient. Well, you, <laughs> You don't only have to uh, project out, you know, like from the uh, left regular representations. You can do uh, other things. And here, you know, like is a circuit for projection from uh, the tensor representation, uh, or like a tensor regular representation, onto its isotypical components, right? And um, and it turns out that if you combine these two circuits together, uh, you may notice that the uh, intersection 
of the of, of its images has a dimension that is equal to d mu d nu d tau and uh, the Kronecker coefficient of mu nu and tau, right? And this observation already implies, you know, like our first result, which is that uh, deciding whether the uh, Kronecker coefficient is non-zero, whether a certain irreducible representation appears in the composition of a tensor product of two other irreducible representations of S n, that was a mouthful, sorry, uh, is actually in QMA, right? And as an intuition, you know, like you can uh, to, to, to basically solidify the intuition for this result, notice that if the Kronecker coefficient is non-zero, then Merlin can find um, a quantum state that sits in the intersection of the images of these two projectors and give it to Arthur, and then, then Arthur literally implements the circuits that I was showing on the, on the past two slides. Um, but uh, at the same time, if the Kronecker coefficient is zero, then the um, you know like the uh, subspaces that these two uh, projectors project onto are orthogonal to one another. I will also point out one thing that actually I I, I didn't mention it, but like this Q uh, um, the projector above that is the projector that uh, was from the tensor representation onto the trivial uh, irreducible representation. I would say, and, and it turns out that this is actually best upper bound uh, on the positivity problem of the Kronecker coefficient. Uh, there is a corresponding lower bound. Uh, it was shown to be, uh, I mean, like this problem was shown to be NP-hard by uh, Christian Nickenmeyer, uh, Mulmule, and um, Walter. And I would also say that actually this result, you know, after we uh, wrote it down, and uh, it turned out that uh, other people were aware of it. So um, it was previously known to Greg Cooperberg, uh, Igor Pak, Greta Panova, and then also uh, to Mike Walter, uh, Matthias Kristandl, and Adam Harrow, but they never, never published it. So uh, this is the first time it appears uh, in print. Let me now tell you a bit about the relationship between Kronecker coefficients and uh, quantum approximate counting. So to do that, I have to tell you a bit about counting complexity. So I guess, you know, like uh, most of you are going to be familiar with uh, the computational class Sharp P. So Sharp P uh, enumerates the number of uh, accepting solutions to an NP problem. And then Gap P is, a diff Gap P is, is another uh, counting complexity class that they can uh, understand as a difference of two, of two, of two Sharp P functions. Um, one small remark here is that like these two classes are not um, are actually like Turing reducible to one another. So you know, like if you have polynomial many uh, queries to one, you can uh, recover the other one. So um, you know, like for uh, those of you who are interested in these kind of things, like you have to use a finer notion of reductions here. But it's a subtle thing. You know, if you're interested in this, you know, like I read the paper and talk to me. But um, what is what is really interesting is that like there. There is another counting uh, complexity class called Sharp BKP. And uh, as far as I'm aware, that class was uh, defined in a paper by Brown, Falmia, and Schur uh, originally. But it was nicely interpreted in a paper by Sergei Bravi, Gosset, and uh, uh, Shuri and Paul Volzian, um, where you know, like, it was characterized by a quantum counting problem. And it, uh, they, they, they essentially show that, you know, uh, uh, this class can be understood as the set of problems where, um, similar to um, a, the setup, you, you, you basically use the same setup as in QMA, but instead of asking for, uh, you know, uh, for um, existence of, a, of, a, of, the, of the correct witness state, like you ask for approximation of the dimension of the subspace from which the uh, from which Maryland is choosing uh, the you bit my state, right? So, so um, to 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 sum it up, you know, like Sharp BQP is, uh, you know, like like pretty much the uh, up to up to up to some small subtleties, you know, like it is the dimension of uh, the uh, uh, subspace from which uh, from which uh, Merlin can choose his uh, advice states that he sends to Arthur, and. Um, you know, like when you care about counting complexity, you very often care about multiplicative approximations, and this is where it gets interesting because uh, any sharp P function has an uh, approximation and a match, uh, you know, like like uh, say um, uh, 
in a weaker uh, class, you know, like or at least conjecture to be weaker, uh, called FBPP with MP. Uh, that goes by uh, Stuckmeyer's counting argument. But uh, in, contra in contrast to that, if I give you a function that is guppy hard, you know, and I ask uh, you to find its multiplicative approximation, I will stay guppy hard. And since you know, like like uh, we have this intermediate, we have this, uh, we have this additional class of uh, sharp BQP that seems unlikely to be uh, actually where, pardon, uh, actually multiplicative approximation seems to be unlikely to be in FBPV with MP because we don't know how to get uh, Stuckmeyer's argument for the class. And at the same time, like we, um, we don't know if it's, uh, if it's uh, as powerful as, as, as Guppy or even like, like what exactly is this relationship with, with Guppy, which uh, actually leads to the definition of uh, QXC, a, a quantum approximate counting class, which is, uh, you know, like the, uh, Actually, I mean, there is a small mistake here, but like it is the uh, multiplicative, multiplicative approximation to the dimension of uh, the subspace from which Merlin can, can choose his witnesses in a QME protocol. Right. So, our second result is that uh, computing Kronecker coefficients is in uh, Sharp BQP. Um, and uh, Approximating uh, the Kronecker coefficients to multiplicative uh, error is in, in, in this class QXC. Now, you may wonder, okay, well, I showed you, you know, that, that there, there are two simple projectors uh, that, uh, you know, like map into a space where the intersection has the dimension equal to, you know, like, like three, three uh, dimension factors times the Kronecker coefficient. And, you know, like you may wonder if, it, if, if, this, if this is enough to place uh, the problem into sharp EQP already. Uh, it turns out that it, that it isn't, and uh, and the reason for that is that you know it, it turns out that even if I give you a a sharp e function, and I promise you that that uh, the sharp e fun function will always evolve to something that's even, and I divide it out by by a small factor like two, uh, it is not at all clear that it's this. Uh, sharp p. So, so we really have to get rid out. Uh, we we really have to really get rid of these uh, dimension factors in order to place the Kronecker uh, coefficient in in in, uh, in inside of sharp BQP. And uh, this is exactly what Christian Eckemeyer and uh, Satya Subramanian managed to do. Uh, they used uh, you know like uh, the fact that the um, SN Fourier transform not only block diagonalizes the left regular representation, but it also block diagonalizes the right regular representation. And uh, this actually induces some nice structure, um, you know, and um, allows you to do, uh, you know, extra projectors that get rid of these uh, extra dimensional factors. Again, like I, I, I don't have time to go into details, but you know, if you're interested, either read the paper or ask me. And, um, let me also tell you a little bit about uh, additional results that we have in the paper. So, um, you know, the circles that you saw uh, previously also suggest a quantum algorithm for computing current coefficients. So, uh, they allow you, in specifically, they allow you to sample from a distribution that looks like this. You know, like uh, you have um, d lambda over d mu, d nu, and then the current coefficient. You know, like if you if you use the character formula that I showed, you know, like uh, in, in, in the beginning, uh, you can convince that this is appropriately normalized. And this means that by resampling, you can get uh, a one over poly additive approximation to, um, you know, like all these all these output uh, output probabilities. Sometimes this is enough to compute the current coefficients uh, on on some 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 inputs. And uh, what is really interesting is that like we are not aware of uh, classical algorithms for like all, all these inputs, right? Um, uh, but uh, at the same time, like it's very fair, uh, it's, it's also fair to say that like uh, we, we may not be aware, uh, not because the problem is going to be hard, but because you know, like it wasn't studied uh, enough. But um, it, is a, it, it is an interesting open question, you know, like to, to, to understand this better, whether uh, this could potentially be a way to argue for you know, quantum advantages. And uh, we also proved related results on 
something called the row sums per one. Um, and I, I encourage you to read the paper if you're interested in these things. So with that, you know, um, that's, uh, that's the end. I'd like to thank you. Uh, I mean, here's a summary of, uh, of everything I talked about and, you know, some open questions. But, um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>
if you manage to prove that uh, Sharp EQP is actually containing GAP with respect to this uh, very fine, uh, you know, like like uh, type of reduction, then uh, you should probably get a uh, the strongest upper bound on the on the on the on the Kronko coefficient. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hey. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was wondering. Um, can your results be generalized to other groups, to other finite groups? Or maybe uh, can you consider uh, the problem of this computing chronicle coefficients for other associative algebras, like finite dimensional algebras? Does it make sense? Can you generalize those ideas to that setting? Right. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, so I mean, uh, it uh, depends on the group. Uh, and um, I mean, you you probably saw, you know, these uh, the projection operators that rely on the uh, genome space estimation, they require a Fourier transform over your group. So, uh, I mean, like, if you want to generalize this straight in a, in, a, in a straightforward way, you know, like, you have to have the right kind of Fourier transforms. That's one thing. The other thing is that uh, you may also ask, you know, similar questions about other multiplicities. You know, like I, I mentioned in, like, this one one-liner here. Um, okay, yeah, it's that. Okay, yeah, here. I, I mentioned the uh, uh, row sums problem. You know, like like uh, there, you don't generalize the problem to um, another group, but you just choose a different representation. It just so happens that the multiplicities there, you know, like like encode uh, other quantities. As for like more general objects, like the associative algebra, you know, like 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 in full generality, I don't know, like um, you, you in, in your work, you know, like your your uh, you you were talking about like a vault brower, you know, and, and stuff like this. Uh, I don't know what comes out of it, actually. Uh, it, it may be generalizable. If you, I mean, actually, in, even in even in your work, like you do have an, some form of a Fourier transform, right? Like, like, like because you have like generalized sure. Uh, maybe there is a way to uh, get something interesting out of it and we have a look at it. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Let's thank the speaker again.